at the time that it was written. It was written in 1895. It was not published until 1952. And it's something that he sends to his friend, please, and discuss with him extensively. And it was a terrific effort on Freud's part with a relatively limited amount of knowledge, not uh, a relatively very limited amount of knowledge that existed about neural function in those days, to try and give, you know, the psychological phenomena that he was observing, the neurological basis that logically had to have, though he couldn't find it at the time. It was all, it was very interesting, but he never published it because he was aware of the, it was never meant to be published. Uh, after his death in 1952, it was published because it was considered a document of enormous value. And though it is all in a neurophysiological language, it contains all of the tenets of psychoanalysis already expressed in a different language, all right? Given that he could not develop them there, he went to the vintage point of view of behavioral observations, you know, and manifestations of behaviors and feelings in people and so on, <coughs> and dealt with that at the level he could deal with it. But the roots of all of that are somewhere in the brain. The basis of all of that are somewhere in the brain. Now, what kind of person do you become? Later on, what kind of resources do you have to deal with the vicissitudes of life, with the uh, things that life will present to you, hard, difficult, harsh, painful, you know, devastating in some occasions, depends on how that structure inside of that body <coughs> in your head have been able to put itself together. And in the past, people believe that the brain got put together, period. It was anatomical and biological forces that put it together. Now we know better. We know that's not true. We know that, yes, it will. And biological and anatomical forces will develop a brain. Will it be the ideal brain? No. It'd be far from an ideal brain. The brain to achieve its most wonderful potential in the genetic blueprint that we are all born with requires the contribution of a large amount of external stimulation that is provided in a variety of different ways, mostly at the beginning of life in the mother-child relationship. Mostly, but not only. Without that, the quality of your brain will go down, the resources of your brain will go down. Later on, we will call that ego strength. Ego strength is a psychological concept. But if you leave it at that, it's floating in the air. What is it based on? Well, it obviously has to be based on the neurological structure that constitutes what we call the ego when they act work and interaction and so on. And obviously how that gets put together will determine when you get into conflicts later on in life, whether it is with your instinct or with the standard world of which you need to be socialized and fight your instinct in order to uh, be adaptive to the society in which you are born will determine what kind of neurosis you will develop or whether you will develop a neurosis or something worse than a neurosis or whether you'll be able to cope with it at all or not or what resources you will have to recover from the vicissitudes that life will present to you. And so I don't want you to believe that all of this happens in blue thin air. It doesn't. It has a basis in uh, the structures in the brain. What happens to your brain, how your brain develops will determine how you cope with life, what kind of adaptation you will make, whether it is normal, whether it is neurotic conflict, whether it is the production of neurotic disorders of whatever type or worse. All right? And so all of this is very important. You see, in the past, 
40 years ago analysts didn't have this knowledge and consequently we had to indeed when I went into this field at the beginning I had to float <laughs> like everybody else we don't have to do that anymore we know where the roots of these things are and we are finding more about it every day and that's what I want to convey to you that's why I'm doing it in this way which is perhaps a little different than uh, have been done in the past the other day, so you know we are going to discuss a little about brain development because that's the basic structure that will organize you as a normal human being or will determine what kind of conflict you have and for what reason and what quality of conflict you'll be able to develop what quality of the things you'll be able to develop how well you'll be able to cope whether it is with your instinctual world and forces or with a standard world or with a conflict between them you know of course we will have a lot to do in what determines much of uh, human life and that is the interaction between genetic givens and environmental influences. Now, you may have the best genetic givens in the world, you may have acquired the best brain that was possible given these genetic givens and receive all the appropriate stimulation <coughs> to develop an ideal brain. And that will be fine. You'll be endowed with the best possibility to deal with the problems that life will present you with, whatever they are. But if what life presents you with is overwhelming, it doesn't matter how good your brain is, it has a limited capacity to deal with trauma and with stress, and at some point it breaks down. That's to the best possible brain, to the already mediocre brain, and maybe that mediocrity is <coughs> genetically determined, that's a possibility. You can do nothing about that. That's a, a lottery. But it will influence what resources you are landed with in order to deal with all of this developmental process and whether you will end by being normal or develop a lot of uh, neurotic conflicts, you know. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is what will happen to you environmentally and how will that interact with the genetic forces. And out of that comes out the psychoanalytic theory of the neurosis. So, um, I don't know what to, do you have questions? Did you see, let's talk first about the psychoanalysis and neurosciences, which is the paper. Do you have questions about it? Did you understand it or do you have problems with it? I got pretty technical in some parts. Um, All right, but well, you may have difficulties. <laughs> I, I realize that some of you may not have the biological background and may be a little difficult, but that's what we are here for. I think the two main technical um, questions I had was by ar arborization, I believe it was. Sure. Is that is, is branching? Is yeah. that Okay. Okay. And the more branching, essentially, the better. Oh. Yeah. Um, the more branching you have, the more connections you have with mm -hmm. more neurons, the more potential path circuits you have, which means the more, it's like a, think of a central telephonic, a central telephonic. You have only four or five who are connecting this with that, you have a very limited uh, telephone uh, central. If you have a very complex organization with all kind of wire connector with all, all the kinds of machines and, and systems and something, you have a very complex organization. So, so marathon runner building capillaries. Yeah. <laughs> and and then that critical period is mm -hmm. that they have to be used during that period or they cease to exist. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely. You see, if to first. Uh, if they don't seek to assist, they don't happen. Dendritization, which is uh, equivalent to vaporization, mm -hmm. uh, is 
some of it will happen anyhow. But the idea requires a spinal stimulation of a variety, a large variety of different stimuli that affect all of the organ senses of the human being. Not just visual stimulation, auditory, all the senses of the human beings. The more you get of that stimulation, the more than the dendritization that it will take place. The more than the dendritization that takes place, the better brain you are developing. The less it happens, the less resources you do have. Right. Now, the brain is very redundant. You know, for some reason, <laughs> evolution has made it so that we have billions and billions and billions of cells and neural connections. But even there, with that redundancy, the quality of your brain would be different if your life experiences developmentally are not adequate. It's a difference between somebody with an IQ of 140, 60, 80, and somebody with an IQ of 80. Yeah, both human beings, both will have a family, they both will uh, have a job. The quality of their life is going to be completely different. What they can do in life will be completely different. The contribution to life is completely different. The contribution to society the enjoyment of the few years that we all have in the world will be completely different and there is not a repeat chance you do it again and you do it better no? unless you believe in you know in, uh, and you will come back as another kind of person or an animal or something like that mm -hmm. uh, you know, you do, you are welcome to it. <laughs> the, um, so that's under the station. Now, there are critical periods, and we know relatively little about this, but we know enough from animal experimentation and from human accident, you know, experiments, in the sense that uh, all kind of things happen to babies, to fetuses before they are born, to premature mm -hmm. children, and these brains are caught, and then obviously we can, uh, you know, uh, make the science of that kind of experiment with uh, life uh, human beings, but uh, these are fate experiments, you know, and, and then we have gathered a lot of information, and if you read it, you saw there a lot of the things that have been gathered, and, and by which means they have been gathered. Nowadays, this is pushing ahead <laughs> phase because the new neuroimaging techniques do allow us to uh, find a lot of things about how the brain functions, and what areas of the brain are the ones that are in charge of what, you know and what combinations of areas of the brain get activated in relation to what activities or what beings or what mental processes and so on. Which just goes to show it doesn't happen on the air, it happens in the brain. <laughs> and what we see is the behavioral retranslation, the feeling retranslation, the, if you want to, the normality retranslation or the neurotic retranslation of all these phenomena that in fact has a neurobiological basis by now. Okay? So they are critical periods. Unfortunately, they are different. For example, much of what we uh, learn about what happens in the eye in terms of myelinization of the optic nerve have been found out in uh, premature babies. Yeah, that was interesting. Huh? That was interesting. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, you see, that was a fate experiment. There are no similar fate experiments for other organ senses mm -hmm. in that which makes things that clear. So we know more in certain areas than in other areas, but it's clear that different areas of the brain that will perform completely different functions yeah, require different forms of stimulation. We don't know essentially what these forms of stimulations are in many cases. I always say 
that is a little bit like uh, what happened with uh, vitamins. Yeah. Yeah. That until we discover the vitamins and knew which role each one of them played, we were subjected to a lot of illnesses because of our vitaminosis, whether it was A, B, C, D, or E, or whatever it was. Once they were discovered, now we know the doses that you need, what is desirable, how much folic acid a mother <coughs> uh, take during the pregnancy so that her baby won't have uh, spina, spina bifida and things of that kind. We know exactly what is needed. Well, I think in good time, the same will be true of this, that we will know exactly what kind of a stimulation and what particular point in the life of the infant is required to achieve the potential ideal development of whatever blueprint God or nature or whatever gave him at birth. And so we will know more and more, and we're learning more and more about it. Wouldn't there, though, be, in terms of the evolution of society and the context in which development occurs, be a kind of a selectivity that reinforces those patterns that optimize brain development over time? Oh, absolutely. That happens all the time. Yeah. That's how we became human beings. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and so and so, what we're really doing is getting better at it. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, but you see, that's the natural process of selection. Right. Unfortunately, because we are so-called intelligent animals, we just don't follow the natural process of selection like other species do. They can do nothing to change the course of selection and evolution. They are just subjected to it. We can go and do things that are against these processes in very Medicine. negative manners. Medicine itself? Absolutely. Yeah. We can alter the course of nature in many ways. We, you know, do all kinds of things that may be prejudicial to that logical, natural improvement that evolution tends to produce, which is the survival of the fittest, mm -hmm. uh, all right? Uh, uh, so that, that will uh, obviously... Uh, but it is said, uh, the general principle is uh, you are correct about that. Unfortunately, because we are intelligent animals, we can work against it. Mm -hmm. And we do, actually, very actively. We do a lot of things that are prejudicial to our health, certainly prejudicial to children development, certainly prejudicial to brain development. Most of the time with the best of intentions, but as they say, the, will, the way to hell is paved with good intentions. You know? So at other times it's because we are the kind of animal that we are, and uh, we are mean, and uh, not all that good much of the time, and uh, quite intent in doing damage uh, when we are angry or uh, hateful and, and that applies to our children just said uh, you know I don't have to tell you that some parents kill their children <laughs> fortunately quite commonly uh, many more abuse them not only sexually but physically and otherwise all of that goes against nature it goes against a natural process what evolution has designed <coughs> in the brain to proceed at the best pace, in the best direction, and at the best speed. We are interfering with it, right? And, and so that's important. Now, the same applies to vascularization, particularly in certain areas of the brain. And that's well demonstrated. And obviously, vascularization and function are very closely related, as you well know, you know. If your brain doesn't have enough oxygen, you will become demented. Your heart doesn't have enough oxygen, you will have a heart attack and possibly die. So when your brain doesn't get enough oxygen, you know. So the degree of vascularization, the more vascularized an organ is, the more functional it is. In a kind of peculiar way, that's true of cancer. Cancer cells are incredibly well vascularized. Mm. And because of that, they grow and kill you. <laughs> you know? uh, and as you know, some of the more novel treatments uh, 
that have been uh, experimented with and some are already available uh, aim directly at stopping the development of the vascular net that feeds the growing cells that grow like crazy. They have an incredible ability to reproduce themselves. That's what the tumor is. And of course, in order to do that, it needs to be fed. And some of the new treatments look at what it is that increases the vascularization of these tumors and can you stop it by somehow interfering with the process and they are being very successful in some cases. Well, this is the same, absolutely the same. The rate of myelinization is important, very important. Myelinization goes from the tip of your head to the tip of your toes and it has a timetable. If you receive what is an expectable, what Winnicott would have called an expectable <laughs> model in the average uh, environment, um, you probably will follow that timetable, but it can be speed up or it can be delayed. And we have a lot of information about that. Um, now, myelinization is extraordinarily important. Why? Well, think of a baby. He is three months old. Well, think of it before he's three months old. His head is wherever it falls. He has no control over his head. He can move his head at will. You know, in fact, as you know, if you hold a baby, you have to hold his head, otherwise it will, it will seem that it will fall off his shoulders, yeah. It takes him 12 weeks, usually, anywhere between 10 and 14 weeks is about the normal period, more closer to 12 weeks, to be able to myelinize his pyramidal ways so that he now has control over the muscles that control the neck and will allow him to erect his head and move it. Well, the baby with the head, wherever it falls, has a limited field of vision. If there is a stimulus over there, he can turn to see what it is and learn from it. And we need to learn. We are constantly learning. Yeah? We are the only animal that has to learn practically everything that he's going to uh, need later on in life to survive. Most of the animals are born with a range of stimulus response behavior that are enough to keep them alive and fulfill the roles that, you know, evolution has designed for them. Not so us. We have to learn everything that we do, essentially. We have the machinery to learn it in the form of our brain and through the interaction with the environment. <laughs> yeah? and learning from the objects, what we at times call identification, when there is a lot more identification, it is, it is a narrow view of how we learn. In any case, at some myelinization goes on and allows them, him to control the muscles of his neck and now he has 180 degrees field of vision you understand the difference that it makes? You see, development is a pyramidal thing. It's like a pyramid, you know. You need the lower layers to build the upper layers, and the upper layers, and if they are not there, you can't build effectively. Whatever you put on top of that layer is going to be very shaky, right? Well, when he can do that, his world has expanded enormously from being fixed in one place to being able to span 180 degrees something happens there he can look and he's learning he's related that stimula now which may have been an auditory stimula possibly a visual stimula if it is some flash of light or anything over there but generally a noise and he will turn he will see his mother or somebody walking or something He's starting to put things together. 
see his learning. He's building his path, his secret path. He's starting to make sense of the world. He's starting to create the networks that will allow him to understand who the hell he is, what is he doing here, and where is all these people around him. <laughs> you know, that increases gradually. We are not born with the knowledge of who we are, what are we doing here, and <laughs> what we can do in the future. We don't know any of that. We learn all of that. And what we can be in the future depends on how good your equipment is. How good your equipment is depends partly on the genetics that you inherited and in partly on the environmental influences which include all these forms of stimuli, you know. So once he does that, now he has, I mean, he's learning in a way that it was impossible to learn into head is always looking in that direction or in whatever direction. The rest of the space is you. The rest of the experience don't have meaning for you. At least not in the kind of scope that they will have at that point. Well, as my session goes on, he controls his shoulders, which means he can open his hands that were closed. He couldn't use his hands for anything. At best, to put his thumb in his mouth accidentally because he could not and will say I'm going to put my finger in my mouth now and stop at it couldn't do that but he had random movement and one of them will get it in the mouth and then he will suck at it by 12 weeks again that has happened and now he opens his hands and he had become an incredible instrument to feel to sense things to learn to touch to touch himself to touch other people to touch objects you, you are acquiring information at an incredible speed you understand what I'm saying he can grab things now he can put them in his mouth he can explore things he can look at them at will he can still see though so for a couple all right now at six months he can sit that's a hell of a change. You see? When you can sit, you are blind on your back. And yeah, you have 180 degrees. Much of it is a ceiling. You know? <laughs> Once you can sit, it's a completely different world of experience. What you learn, what goes into your brain, what kind of stimuli your brain receives. These are the forms of stimuli that create all of these processes and the quality of your brain in the in the last resort. I don't need to tell you that by the time he can walk, his wall expands in an incredible manner. Now children that have been left in foundling homes, for example, orphanages, things of that type in the past. And this is very well documented by the world of uh, by the work of Sally Province and Lipton that were at jail. Uh, they wrote a book which everybody should read at some point. It's called Infants in Institutions. Okay. Uh, both of these authors are dead now, but their contribution is, is I don't know, is, uh, will be there forever and ever and ever because it was tremendous like a speech work, you know. <coughs> um, you certainly be able to find it if not new second hand, uh, you know, but possibly even new, it may well still be in print. Uh, what they did, they studied, <coughs> like a speed had done, children institution. And like a speed found, if children that are grown in a family home and orphanage, which essentially means they are under-stimulated. They don't have a mother. That is, they're all the time talking to them, feeding them, bathing them, walking them, singing to them, touching them, jumping them, mm -hmm. and taking them out, uh, walking them outside. They are in a court, period. If they are lucky, they get fed in time. <laughs> they piss on themselves, they may be pissed for hours and things of that kind. Well, these children become developmentally retarded. And in that situation, some children 
that a 12, 14, 16, 18 months can sit, may not have good control of the neck yet. That's a hell of a developmental retardation. You know what that means? If you will say, well, the brain is being damaged. Yes, yeah, sure, it's being damaged. But you know, that's the anatomical structure. The function that goes with that anatomical structure <coughs> is going to be there. If they are not learning what they need to learn, they are not developing the pathways that they need to develop in order to be normal and to have the necessary resources to cope with whatever it is that they will have to cope later on. They simply are not there, you know. And for that too, they are critical periods. You know, when uh, I was a kid, I was in a school that it was uh, run by brothers, religious brothers, called Maristas. <laughs> and uh, there was an orphanage in Havana that was a very well-known uh, orphanage, which incidentally was a wonderful orphanage. I didn't know that, but the Spitz visited it one day and I took him there. And this was when I was a very young man. And uh, I took them with enormous trepidation. I said, what is he going to find here? <laughs> you know? And uh, once he got there, his eyes pop open. And uh, he said, you know, this is the best orphanage I have seen in my life. I said, why? Why do you say that? He said, well, uh, and he started to describe to me what it was, just as he described to me what wonderful as it was, how these children were damaged, and how it already you could see it. These children <coughs> have, they were living in an orphanage, and they had a hunger for objects. Anybody that came, they flocked to him, like flies to candy, you know? Completely indiscriminate. No my children don't do that. Not a certain age, a stranger is somebody that they keep away. That's a normal response. These children flock to them as if as a fly to candy. And he pointed this out, seems to me. And so I remember asking him, why do you think that he, this is better than most of the other places that you say you have seen? He said, well, I think it's probably very simple. It was run by nuns. <laughs> the nuns live there. And the nuns adopted some of these children, and uh, they were there 24 hours a day. They sometimes came in the evening and, uh, you know, interacted with them and so on. In any case, in this school where I was, these children got scholarships, and they were there. We always knew uh, who, was raised who they raised. were. We always, they didn't have to tell us. We knew they were different, and we knew. Everybody in the school knew that that was a child from like the house of what's called La Casa de Beneficencia, the house of uh, whatever. Beneficence. Beneficence. Yeah. You know, you know why? They were different. They looked different? Huh? They looked different? No, they <coughs> didn't particularly look different, but once you interacted with them, they were different. Mm -hmm. Their speech was different. They didn't have the same language skills that other people had. They could speak. They could run, but they didn't have the skills in the running that I did have. Yeah. <laughs> they were different, not to work How they carry themselves. Yeah, How they, they walk, were completely okay. different. Everybody knew. That give you an idea of, 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 of the phenomenon. The other thing that happens is that stimulation favors certain biochemical processes that indeed promote development. And you read some of them in there. I'm not going to go through that. But all of these things put together create the kind of basis on which either normality or psychopathology is going to develop. And clearly, the more handicapped that instrument is, the more likely it is that you're going to develop psychopathology. And the more severe that these forms of psychopathology may be because you have less resources to deal with whatever it is that the conflicts are that can be resolved satisfactorily and will lead to the formation of symptoms, you know. So that's important. I have one question about one sure. of the studies. They talked about Shore and Stern, talked about the sensitive period between six months and a year. Mm -hmm. 
for the um, prefrontal cortex that regulates high positive affective states. And almost what are the implications for that in depression? Um, I don't know in depression. Okay. I, I really don't know. Uh, but the, the prefrontal uh, cortex is really a, an extraordinary interesting area of the brain. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Nowadays, these are all studies. Nowadays, the new uh, findings show that the prefrontal cortex is one of the areas of the brain that develop later. In fact, mm -hmm. it fully develops at puberty. We didn't know that before. In fact, there is a second proliferation of neurons in the prefrontal cortex and puberty. Mm. And some people explain the peculiarities of adolescence on that basis because they develop mm. the sexual apparatus, <laughs> but they don't have the controls <laughs> for the impulsivity. The and judgment. Yeah, they, they, they lack the judgment. Mm -hmm. And the balance doesn't get reestablished until that second proliferation that then gives the resources to control mm. the impulses later on. That's the way some people conceptualize it. What is true is this. There is, in adolescence, an spur enormous of growth in the prefrontal cortex. And the mm. prefrontal cortex, as you know, has a lot to do with the control uh, of uh, impulses. So all of these things are coming very rapidly. In fact, I'm, uh, I'm always working on these things. I follow all of these developments very closely, have done all my life. And uh, in a little while I will write about what has been found more recently that is enlightening to us as analysts, you know. <coughs> in any case, you read too there somewhere, did you not? the difference between us and rats mm -hmm. is not that significant in terms of the genome, is it? It's a good sovereign thought for our grand host. The ligation of the mothers and the breastfeeding of the children, of the rat pups. Now the rat pups. Yeah. 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 That, that, that is obviously, uh, these yeah. are all very interesting yeah. experiments. They have been very well, uh, you know, uh, tested through time. But um, now the other thing that is uh, to me of great interest, and I hope you pay attention to, is the role. of the constant object. Yeah. Did you understand that? Did you mm -hmm. understand why? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The familiarity right. and consistency of the routine mm -hmm. to establish this link. It's not attachment, it, per se. It is just the, the regu regularity of the um, all the behaviors that are associated with one particular individual person. And then that helps them develop in the small group. That, that is essential. Yeah. Otherwise, it's extraordinarily confusing. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why children that are constantly moved from one place to another uh, have a lot of trouble. Because they don't have the constancy of the object. And without a constancy of the object, all the learning processes get disrupted. Mm -hmm. Let alone that the constancy of the object is essential for the development of object constancy. Mm -hmm. you understand what object constancy is? Emotional what is object, object constancy? Well, it's not, as opposed to regularity, it would be an internal conceptualization of that particular individual in, in, in their mind. That's mm -hmm. part of it. That whether they're there or That's not. That's a malarian uh, concept. Mm -hmm. Whether they're there or not, the uh, person You can hold the object. object. The person still exists whether they're in your presence or away. Isn't yeah. that okay? That's partly too. But you see, object constancy is, uh, has several meanings. One is the one that Heather is referred to, which is a malarian idea of object constancy. Uh, 
the another definition of object constancy is by contrast. See, human beings, when they are born babies, are not attached to any particular object. The fact that they were born of a particular mother doesn't mean a damn thing. Nothing. There's no attachment between that child and that mother at all. In fact, you can change the mother and he will not whisper. Nothing. In fact, that would be true for the first six months of life. <laughs> Which means what is important is the satisfaction of the need. You satisfy the need of the child. Whoever is the need satisfier is an important person for the child. The object is irrelevant. The satisfaction of the need is relevant. You can change the object all you want. In fact, they are not object related. They are need related. Now, if you stay in that stage, you are in trouble. You never relate to objects normally. Because what is important is not the object per se. It never becomes important. What is important is does whatever object it is gratify your needs. If it doesn't, you're going to abandon it. And if you're an adult and that's the way you relate to your objects, that's a real problem. So object constancy is holding the in the Freudian Hartman sense of the word means something completely different. Mean that at some point the object becomes important not because it gratifies your needs, but because it is object that up to that point gratify your need. That at some point, then the concept of object constancy is developed, which means now the object has become important, as important as the need, and the child will suffer tremendously if the object is removed, even though somebody else may come and gratify the need that he has, which eventually he will accept the substitute because, you know, that's survival. But, once object constancy has been established, the child will reject feeding from that person that tried to substitute for that object because the object has been important per se, not because of the function that it performs. And that's the highest quality of human relationships that are possible. That is impossible without constancy of the caretaker. It requires many, 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 many months of interaction with the same object hmm? for that to develop. In fact, object constancy doesn't appear. It appears somewhere between the 14th and the 18th months of life. And it requires constant interaction with an object, otherwise it won't take place properly. It may never take place if people may only relate at the need satisfaction level. Then we will call them whatever you call one borderline narcissistic kind of disorders and so on. In fact, what they have is damage in their ability to build object relationship because all later relationships are based on that model. So, so that the special problems that adopted children have, those who are adopted at birth or at infancy, are the result of learning later about their adoption? I mean, yeah. assuming oh, they... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. These children, children will develop object constancy. They are adopted early and mm -hmm. they are normal. Right. Now, a lot of the children have a lot of problems because generally they may come, uh, the fact that they have been abandoned by the parents, that they couldn't be kept by the parents. Later, yeah. It's, yeah, I know, but it already means that they may have a damaged genetic pool. You see, these may be borderline people, psychotic people, uh, impulsive people, uh, people with uh, no impulse control, uh, drug addicts, you name it. Whatever it may be, these children may be tainted, and that's a problem. But many of them won't have a problem, just, I mean, many people simply for a number of reasons uh, may well get into a pregnancy, cannot keep the child and give it up for the adoption, and they may have a reasonable genetic pool. If that's the case, and the child 
is the best time to adopt is immediately after birth. The closer to it, the best it is. The more you move up the ladder, the more you will have problems later on with that child because these processes are not going to take place and this child, you know, is not going to be able to develop budget constancy for with you. There is a period to do that. You get a child at three who has not developed budget constancy. You can keep them for the next 20 years. It's not going to develop it. How about if they've developed it with another caretaker? If they then it becomes a broken bot. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Then he lost an object. He'd okay. be devastated. And that frequently happens to yeah. If they happen to be foster in a good place with a good foster parent, and they have been there long enough to have developed object consciousness, when they get adopted later on by somebody else, they are in trouble. They lost an object. Mm -hmm. And these people are responsible for that loss. Mm -hmm. And that will have repercussions later on, you know. Now, let alone that what Bill is referring to is absolutely true. You see, the idea that, oh, you were wonderful, we love you, you were chosen. That sounds very good when you are two. <laughs> you say, oh, I was chosen. Huh? By the time you're three and a half or four, you say, bullshit. I was abandoned by my parents. That's what chosen means. That's why I was chosen. And that is one of the hardest bone to swallow for a human being. And it's not abandonment by the father or by the couple. It's abandonment by the mother. It's the mother that gets the blame. Typically. If you want to learn about adoption, we have a good lecture on adoption in the, in the web page. We used to have, I used to have in Ann Arbor, a large project on adoption that ran for years and years. We never published anything because it was too touchy to be able to do it. No. But we learned an enormous, in fact, Herman, that you just had him, mm. was a member of the group. Uh, in those days, he was a student there. And uh, so we gathered an enormous amount of information, and I have, from those times here, I still have them, about eight or ten tapes of people that were adopted and participated in these research projects as adults and wanted to come and l describe their life experiences and what they knew about it, when they knew about it, how they reacted to it, what feelings they have, what uh, restrictions that impose in their life, what feelings they have for the adopted parents and so on. And they came in all sizes and shapes. It depends. When they were adopted, it depends on what the genetic endowment was and it depends to on how the adoption was handled. See, frequently, adoptive parents, I just saw one the other day uh, at the university, an ADHD kid actually who came with a woman that has posed as her mother. She's not the mother of the kid. She is the sister of the father. <coughs> and the father died. He was a drug addict, obviously, a, a, a blue bolt that got himself into trouble and uh, <coughs> was killed or died or committed suicide. Something happened. And she adopted the child. And she's not telling the child because she didn't come to me for that and I didn't <laughs> interfere with it. She came to, to me because the child has a severe form of ADHD that is highly treatable and she, treatable and she, do, she should do very well. Obviously came from the father. But she's not telling that child. Well, that child is going to find out mm -hmm. if she doesn't know it already. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that is most destructive to a relationship to adoptive parents is to be lied to. Mm -hmm. If they find that you lied to them, and how that they will never forgive you. It usually undermines the relationship to an incredible degree. Now this is good because you see these children will have a lot of problems later on. Problems of adaptation to life, to society, to uh, marriage, to having children, to uh, they have all kinds of problems they may have. Not necessarily, not all of them. You know, we have had at least a couple of presidents that were adopted. Did you know that? 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, get our food was an adopted kid. Really? Yes. And we had another one, I forget what his name huh? But we had two that were adopted. So, and there are famous people that were adopted people. Writers, literary figures, and so on. So not all of them in Bali, but a large number of them in very Bali. In fact, the truth is that they are highly represented in outpatient and inpatient departments, well past the proportion in... Uh, <coughs> the regular... Uh, so, it's all, as you see, it's complex. But it shows how all of these things get put together and then make you what you are <laughs> or what you will be. Give you the potential that you will have to deal with all of this. That's a sudden stress. Suddenly at 15, 16, 18, maybe when you go to get your driver's license to find out that your parents are not really your parents. You know what that is? I have tapes of people who went through that experience and describe it vividly. I have them here. You can see them if you want to. It's very dramatic. Enormous difference with those that were told from the very beginning that they were adopted. Enormous difference. You should never try to hide that from an adopted child because they always find out okay. sooner or later. You know, it's impossible to keep that kind of a secret. Is it the same with the egg donors and all of with we, technology? You know, we, say we, a, a mother has an egg donor. Is it the same sort well, of thing? Well, I don't thing? know because that's a relatively new phenomenon. Yeah. And uh, I wouldn't think it's the same because, um, it, you mean she grew the egg in herself? For a very, surrogate mother. Yeah, right. I would have very little... Uh, it's possible it could have the same... I wouldn't mm -hmm. think so, okay. no. It will have some. Mm -hmm. It could have some. Because at some point when you find that some boy that you are, you grew in this woman's mm -hmm. womb. But your mother is a different woman. You mm -hmm. have the problem of all of the children. Who is that woman? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where is she? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. And that's a... That's a dimension that most human beings don't have to consider in yeah. their life. And it influences. Uh, you significantly. How much will depend on what kind of relationship mm -hmm. you have to your adoptive parents. You see, children that have very good relationship with their adoptive mm -hmm. parents can master that mm -hmm. in a reasonable fashion. It doesn't mean to say that it isn't there, that there is no resource spot there that will never really heal. It is there, but you can handle it in a way that is not maladaptive while most of them do it in a maladaptive way. And you know what happens? They become delinquent, they become social, they carry a chip on the shoulder, they are at war with society, they burn down the adoptive parents' houses, mm -hmm. destroy the tools, the cars, the whatever it is, and hit them with a passion. And frequently repeat the parents' behavior. If it is a girl, she's likely to have, have a child. You know, <laughs> a pregnancy that uh, she shouldn't have. And uh, it's, 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 it's really very interesting. You should look at the, at the thing because, you know, these things give you... They are caricatures of what happens to normal people. They apply to a particular area of development that in them have become enormously highlighted. Right? But it happens in one degree or another to all of us because all human beings have family romance fantasies. How active they are in any one of us is different, but there is not a human being, normal human being, that has not had a family romance fantasy. That's common. Which means you think your parents are not your parents, but somebody else is your parents. They are richer, they are nicer, they give you the things you want, whatever it is, you know what I mean? And uh, so we all have a little bit of that. Obviously we have a reality that we have learned this our parents. The reality of the adopted child is that these are not the parents. Mm -hmm. Just like the reality of a biological parent with a child is that you're landed with him. It's your child. 
the reality of an adoptive parent is different. He said, well, this is not my blood, which essentially implies if it were my blood, this wouldn't be happening. One is, part of me keeps wondering how much of our behavior is genetically determined, you know, and let's say, let's go back to, to the supposition, what you said earlier, which is, I believe is true also, that you have, um, that the pool of people who are up for adoption of children are, are select to begin with, because you do have a lot of people who, who let's say, have depression or acting out or other illnesses uh, that may or may not be treated and these end up getting pregnant and uh, yeah, sure. yeah. so I agree with that. So then the question becomes the fourteen year old who who was adopted whose mother had that behavior, how much of what happens is because she herself is having uh, depression, just like her mother did, you know, pass it through generations genetically. And I don't know if anybody depression, can that. genuine depression. Mm -hmm. don't, don't make people active sexually. What about, oh, well, I mean the manic, bipolar manic. Well, the bipolar yeah. person is different, yeah. but then uh, if that is the case, that's the case, but not every adopted child is bipolar. Many adopted children come from people that yeah. don't have that genetic load. So obviously there are a large number of variables that influence it. If you have that kind of genetic background, yeah. yes, you will have a predisposition in this case is yeah. dangerous this is a combination of genetic factors and environmental experiences that will lead you in the same direction but that doesn't mean that the genes are determined that you will become pregnant in fact most of the girls that become pregnant do so as an identification with the mother it's a way of restoring the mother's credibility and peace because what they are saying is mother I really don't hate you I love you. I am exactly like you are. Mm. I too am carrying a child. And I too will have to give it away. <laughs> you see what I mean? And that means you and I are one and the same. It's, it's a way of saying I love you. <laughs> Can it also be an identification with the aggressor? Of yes, it is in some part. form. Yeah. In some distorted form. So these things are very complex, but human nature is very complex. The reason you see, <coughs> these girls that become pregnant, which is common in, adop in adopted girls, they commonly repeat the behavior of the, of, the, of the mother, at least the fantasy behavior of the mother, and become pregnant themselves. But when you have them in treatment, and with it we had that research project, you find that that is an act of peace at the same time that it is a very destructive act. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, okay. It reconciles them with the mother. Absolutely. Yeah. So we, we are one and the same. I really don't hate you. My behavior is like yours. We are, you know, from the same... Uh, we are made of the same wood. <laughs> um, Okay, well, in any case, we are going too far away from where we should be. Can I ask a question about no, object okay. consciousness? Yeah. So in terms of Freud's definition, it's the need satisf the, the tie to the object based on not needs, but that the object tie is more important than the needs, or they can sustain it. The malarian object constancy, do you use that still to apply yeah, you, you in terms use of children's readiness for school? Is that... Uh, well, no, you see, yeah. the Valerian concept is a cognitive mm -hmm. concept. You know, what you have developed the cognitive capacity to retain in the cognitive sense in your mind in the absence of the object, mm -hmm. the object mm -hmm. is now alive in you. That's not true early on in life, at least not in a constant manner. Mm -hmm. Indeed, these things are very interesting and the basis of the neurosis, all of them. Let me give you an example. A toddler, normal toddler in a normal family, attached to the mother, 18 months, 20 months, 22 months. The mother goes away. It gets very rattled because at that moment, going away, 
is not she's coming back. He doesn't understand that she's coming mm -hmm. back. She's reacting to she's gone away. Well, that mother went to the hairdresser and she was blown and now comes with uh, brown hair. <laughs> the child wouldn't recognize her. He would look at her <laughs> and uh, cry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Until sure. she talks to him, she mm -hmm. may have some problem to mm -hmm. comfort him and convince him that she is the same person, which means he doesn't have a clear cognitive, in the cognitive sense of the word, okay. picture of, of the object, mm -hmm. in the malarian sense. Yet, in the other sense, it's a very clear picture. That's why he's disturbed, mm -hmm. because he's not finding the mother that he's Yeah, he has a picture that he expects. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you see, and that's why it is very interesting and is at the basis of the disturbances of human beings. See, there is a tendency, that's where I want to get you out of, to think in narrow pathways and just concentrate on the conflict between the ego and the id and see if that's all this, or the super ego and ego id the kind of conflict which are obviously important, but they are not the only ones. All of that is based on what came before. And for example, you know the experiments of Lawrence, Conrad Lawrence, yeah? With geese? Imprinting, uh, yes. Uh, right after Imprinting. the first. Yes. Yeah. Imprinting. <coughs> Do you know what imprinting is? Mm -hmm. It's the development of object consciousness in, in an instant. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Yeah. And you know how these animals do it? They usually go and nest when nothing else is around. They don't come and nest in their patio or your house. <laughs> they go to isolated areas. You know why? Because the moment that little geese is hatching, whatever moves in his field of vision is mother. And he develops all your constancy automatically. That is where safe and trust is. He will follow that anywhere. That's what Lawrence is. As they were hatching, he moved in front of them, and he had all these little goose following him all over the place because he became mother goose. They achieve object constancy immediately. And in the animals, obviously that concept is linked with the need satisfaction because it is, is that mother goose that is going to provide for them. And it can happen any other way. They don't have uh, foundling homes, they don't have orphanages, they don't <coughs> have nannies. Uh, that's a human creation. That's what we do because we are intelligent that goes against evolution. You know, the normal forces of evolution. We work against it very effectively. Well, what happens in an instant in the goose takes 14 to 18 months in a human being. And it doesn't happen just because the mother walks in front of him. It takes 14 to 18 months of certain type of stimulation and interaction. And if that is constant and consistent, at around that time, 40 months more frequently than not, he will have the well of object constancy, which means if that object disappears, now the, he will suffer tremendously, it's a, a, a big trauma, and he cannot accept a substitute readily. A few months earlier he would have. Six months, the mother dies, somebody has come and put the bottle in his mouth, he sucks at it. You won't see any difference. By eight, ten months, he starts to, uh, he's on the way to object constancy, and he develops a stranger anxiety. So, you are not familiar, he's a little leery about it, but the need will overwhelm, you know, that initial reluctance. By 14 months, it's a catastrophic event. That child may be days refusing the food from a substitute person, you know. Many people don't know that. <laughs> it's, uh, but all of these things have something to do with who you are, how you relate, how you handle your impulses, how you express your instinct. You see, we say, well, object relationships, 
Well, yeah, that's the basis of object relationship. All other later relationships in human beings are based, are you in the need satisfaction phase or have you reached object constancy? If you are in the need satisfaction phase, you only will look for objects that gratify you need the moment that that woman that you married is not able to provide for your needs, you will abandon her. She's no longer a suitable object because you only relate on the basis of the gratification of your need and you can help. You are not a bad person. That's the way you brain got wired. You understand what I mean? It's not a neurotic conflict. It's a structural defect. That's the way your brain got wired cannot be changed by anything that we know how to do at the present time. It's hardwired. It's hardwired. Psychoanalysis is not going to change that. Psychotherapy is not going to change that. Whoever tells you to the contrary is lying to you or is ignorant and don't have enough experience of it. Now, once object consciousness has been reached, that's the model for all later relationships then you value the object per se. The object has value. You love the object because of who she is or who he is, if you are a woman, and your relationship to them quite independently of what they provide. Of course, you know, in the long run, or on the basis of all human relationships, what do you think we relate to objects for? Survival. Huh? Survival. No? Love it, that's, it. that's in the societal sense. Yeah, there is an element of that, but that's more in the societal sense, large groups. But why do you think a man fetch uh, or marries a woman or a woman marries a man? Acceptance. Huh? Acceptance, nurturance. Um, yeah, there is all of that, and there is object constancy. Mm -hmm. You value the object per se, and this object meets some of your requirements, mm -hmm. but in the end, in the, if you look at it closely, object relationship is nothing but the gratification of the instinctual needs of the subject. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's it. <laughs> With an object that is suitable. That's what it is. In the long run, that's what it is. But because you reach object constancy, that can be modulated. If you have not reached object constancy, that can be modulated and you will abandon the object the moment. But you, let's face it, is that's what object relationship is. It's the gratification through your ego or your instinctual needs through the ego yeah, of another person who is doing the same with you. It's, it's, an, it's a two-way communication strength and certain factors are there and if they are there, it's a wonderful relationship. But in the end, it is that. You never hear of people that get married and celebrate. Do you? And what? as celibate oh. that doesn't happen it only happens in very abnormal situations we have needs we are animals with needs and the needs certain needs have to be gratified through another person there is no alternative to it and you can do it in an animal manner you go and fuck like dogs do whatever they smell that there is a bitch in it, they won't fuck the bitch and go the wrong way. That's the end of that. Uh, human they beings... Don't have object no. Human <laughs> beings... Sounds like sociopaths, too. That's correct. <laughs> or people that function at the need satisfaction mm -hmm. level. You see, you develop object constancy. And of course you have the need. And of course you are going to gratify. But of course you are not going to abandon that person the moment that person cannot gratify your needs. You are attached to the person per se. And now the person <coughs> means something to you. But basically, deep down, that's the basis of the relationship. You know? Let's face it. That's the way it is. You become a widow at a relatively recent your own age. What do you think will happen? No matter how much you love that woman, how much that woman loves her husband. What is going to happen? 
they need to find somebody else to meet their needs. Their instincts will now you be on the certain conditions, not like a dog that goes on top whatever walks that smells like being in heat, you know, it'd be something different. But we're animals. Let's face it. You know, that's the truth. And well, speaking of that, the adaptive reality of life. <laughs> <laughs> the reality I think is even better because the adaptive value of having children not have object constancy until six months make a lot of sense when you realize that before penicillin, the infant more, the maternal mortality rate was so high that children, if they couldn't, the species wouldn't survive because the mortality rate was so high. It has some adaptive value. Yeah. That has some adaptive value. Whether that was the reason for it or not, I don't know. That's teleological thinking, but it mm -hmm. certainly has some active value. Well, what doesn't make a lot of sense is that evolution would lead us to evolve to the point that we could circumvent it. Right. That's it's okay. almost like a virus that kills its host. Yeah. Well, we do that. Actually, we do do that. Remember, <clears throat> though we have this instinct one, organization that really motivates most of our behavior in sublimated, reacted, formated forms, you know, displaced forms, uh, uh, humanized, uh, if, if you can call them that, uh, candinized, I would say, uh, uh, kind of forms, rather than an animal, brutal uh, gratification of impulses. Um, that's all true. But it has its own limitations. I was going to tell you something, but it, it went off my mind for the moment. It will come back. Uh, what was it? I was going to give you an example. Um, what were you talking about? I was about? talking about evolution yeah. evolving us to the point that we could circumvent it. Yeah, with medicine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In other words, that, yeah, that, that I know that. The I know now. I was telling you that though we all have that instinctual organization that in fact motivates our life and organize society. The way society is organized is based on how we have decided to gratify the instincts to ensure survival and make things easier right. and kinder. Right. right? But that's what it is. <laughs> And, you know, the ethical considerations and all of that grew out all of that, but still animals. Mm -hmm. Yet there are people who can restrict their instincts completely. They can sublimate them completely. Because there are people that go to, let's say, religious organizations that are really celibate for life. And they really don't gratify the sexual needs they can offer them to God as they offer any other suffering to God and so on. And all the peoples, all the other people uh, that will for whatever look at the terrorists. Yeah. That who what? The take their lives the terrorists. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. You see, it, it goes against yeah. the self-preservation. Right. And that's an extraordinary strong instinct in most of us, you know? Yeah. Uh, and it's certainly socially and ethically acceptable that we can defend our life by killing uh, whoever is trying to hurt us. Not these people. They can give their life from what they think is an idea. We think they are crazy, but they don't think they are crazy. It could come out of conflict as well, couldn't it? And what? It could come out of conflict yeah, as well. Yeah, you very good. very good. very good. In any case, that's a, the part that I wanted you to look at a little bit. Um, and I have here the comparison between the rats and humans. So that you realize that we are all animals. This idea that we are different and that we were especially created by God is all fine and dandy, may even be true. But he used a mold that was an animal mold. <laughs> and the difference is very limited in the number of genes that will determine certain things and make you into a human instead of a rat. And it's not that large. 
Why do pharmaceutical companies have the animal labs? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> No. All right. And it also accounts for the resemblance between some human beings. <laughs> 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 so, yes, but that, that's something? important. That's important for you to know because your patients are animals, and you too are an animal, and you have to accept human nature for what it is. That's a bad negative. Not necessarily negative, but what can create a lot of problems for human beings and lead to a lot of tribulation. But don't forget that by the same token, we have the ability to sublimate, to create reaction formation, to be generous, to be kind, to sacrifice ourselves for others, to love above hate, you know. So that, that is the two sides, and you have to be realistic about it. We are not all bad, nobody is all bad, nobody is all good. Whoever tells you that he's all good is uh, laughable. <laughs> no? You're welcome to believe it if you want to, but don't, I wouldn't. <laughs> all right, let's take a little break, and I think we have to come back and for a second, isn't that right? Yeah.